Okay, I'm just going to give a quick introduction about what we're going to talk about, and then I'm going to hand over to Dora to tell you the Italian story. Before I go ahead with that, I'd perhaps like to tell you two stories, two things that happened to me. The, perhaps one very positive and one not so positive. And they give you a good idea of where I think sort of gender equality is going and some of the ways it might go. So I think the first one is I was at a political event. Um, I was invited because the cooperative group was sponsoring the dinner. And I turned up, and it was great. I was on the top table with two politicians. I was feeling quite important. And I sat down next to this nice gentleman. I'm not going to name where he was from. Uh, but he was very senior in his organisation and in politics. And he leant forward and introduced himself, and it was all very lovely. And then he said to me, So whose wife are you? <laughs> I have to say, I was fairly... Stunned. I'm not a person that doesn't often have some, some sort of retort, but I couldn't think of an answer. I'm not married, so I'm nobody's wife, but why was I being asked this question? And by the time I got home, I was really cross. I was really, really cross that somehow, at this event, where I'd gone representing the cooperative group, I was really proud to be there. I'd somehow, with the validation had to be, whose wife was I? And so it made me really angry. The other experience, perhaps a more positive experience, was my opportunity to go to Cancun and, and the ICA gender representative for the UK. Very proud to be part of that. And I went into the gender conference, so very similar this time last year. And I walked in and there was 50% male in the audience. Lots of people from, lots of men from Mexico, lots of men from South America. I was like, hmm, this is a bit odd, what's going on here? having been very used to gender conferences where it's majoritively female. So I was worried about whether there was a tension, were they coming here to protest, what was the purpose? And what was absolutely fascinating for me was they were there to support their women, not in a patronising way, not in a sort of their, their, dear way. They were there to champion gender equality. And I think for me that was quite a turning point because we've heard a lot today about lots of different things that are going on. But what I'd really like us to see in the UK getting to is a point where we sit together and champion this issue together and we're not having this separation. Someone talked about earlier this demonisation. We need to get to the situation where we can stand together and work together. And for me, that experience was so positive. But we're going to talk a bit about Italy and we're going to talk a bit about the UK. I have to say my board directors have stolen some of my thunder, but um, fair enough. Uh, on some of the stats, but I'm going to hand over to Dora, who's going to talk about Italy to st start with. Uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to speak in this forum on the theme of female employment, on women in cooperatives, and how the cooperative form of enterprise can respond to the need to increase the female participation in the labor market. Today, uh, I am representing three equal opportunity bodies of the cooperative organization, making up the Alliance of Italian Cooperative. Personally, I am president of Lega Cops Equal Opportunity Committee. It's very important that the International Cooperative Alliance and Cooperative United have provided this opportunity in, consider in consideration of the importance the different cooperative system have given to this issue as well as the programs that several European cooperative organizations are promoting. I would like to start with the general picture of the Italian situation. The low level of female employment is one of the most critical factors in the Italian labor market. Certainly, in recent decades, the pattern of female participation in the labor market has changed because the propensity to work of new generations has increased 
and the structural factors that have traditionally limited the number of women in employment have been partially reduced. However, despite these improvements in Italy, the female employment rate is, is still very far from the other develop, developed countries, particularly in Europe. You can see um, in this slide uh, some figures about the critical situation in Italy. A female employment rate of 46.1%, a female unemployment rate higher that than, uh, than that of, of males, uh, a very high inactivity rate, 48.9%, uh, and higher than the European equivalent at 35.5%, uh, um, and a strong sign of women's discouragement in job seeking. Together with the difficulty to find a job, many women in Italy do not even try any, anymore. Um, the data is worse, is worse if we consider the southern Italian areas and young women. We could forecast a further worsening to, due to the crisis that our economy is going through. Other information uh, helping to give a picture of the Italian situation is 30% uh, of, of mothers leave work for family reasons. Uh, there are also significant barriers to career path, and during their entire working life, uh, women are more underutilized, especially if they are graduates. Few women are in decision-making position, even if they come out from schools and universities with higher grades than men. To give a few examples, only 27% of executives, only 6.1% of board members of listed companies, 19% um, entrepreneurs, 18.4% uh, uh, of full, prof full professors, 3.8% of the ambassadors, no women and the top of the judiciary, etc. Moreover, the net monthly salary of women employees is about 20% less than men's. The situation um, is determined by problems related to the structure of the Italian productive system, to the insufficient welfare system for which women are the main caregivers in Italian society, and then for the persistence of cultural patterns penalizing the role of women, still widespread in Italy. The, co the cooperative experiences in terms of female employment are dissonant with the Italian picture because the presence of women is important both in terms of total employment and of the number of members. Uh, cooperatives have in their DNA the focus on personal fulfillment and the satisfaction of all stakeholders' needs. In this sense, they have been important means of, of absorbing female employment. The latest data relating to the three alliances of Italian cooperative members have shown an average female presence of 53% of employees, with some sector exceeding 60% as the social sector. In addition, both quantitative and qualitative analysis of female employment in cooperatives show that cooperatives offer permanent labor contract to women. They guarantee employment continuity. Women can enter the cooperative for all their working life. Uh, then, cooperative uh, seem to be more attentive to the needs of women, balancing work with the periods of no working, for reasons relating to, to family or motherhood. 
In many cooperatives, there are experiences of excellence, um, of excellence in terms of work-life balance, in particular for maternity safeguarding, flexibility in working, uh, and conditions, and the presence of services for childcare, elderly, disabled, all services that, that are classically covered by women, often representing an obstacle to work-life balance. An important project uh, titled Family Enterprise Work has been carried out by one of the three Italian cooperative organizations, Conf Cooperative, which has given a framework of the answer that the cooperative offers to the need for a work-life balance. It promotes a family-friendly culture in cooperative enterprises, developing the mutual benefits and well-being for both the cooperator and their families. But cooperative company policies for work-life balance are not always sufficiently formalized, and mostly there are significant difficulties in creating career paths and participation of women in the enterprises. Female participation in the company boards of the three larger cooperative organizations confirm this situation. It's only 23.9%. The cooperative world, particularly attentive to defending employment, social responsibility, respect of, for diversity, and not only those of gender, is called upon to make a further step. Uh, it has to promote all the human capital, taking the, into account the particular futures of the various inputs, especially those of gender. With regard to work-life balance, the cooperative system is an important player in the overall welfare system in Italy. It can play a key role in improving the relation between women and the labor market in a critical moment when the public administrations are showing difficulty in providing an effective and sustainable answer. It's a role that the cooperative can play within its own system and in the country as a whole. A new welf welfare system is necessary that can facilitate the work of women through a public spending review related to services and also opening up more space for actors from the private sector. This doesn't mean reducing the importance of the public sector, also rebuilding its presence, but recognizing innovative models of services coming from the private sector. Cooperative can further improve the internal organization and welfare for their members and employees, the tool and policies for work-life work balance, but, but can also promote and carry out services for women using the network model that is the main way to achieve stable results. As well, the presence of several service companies in the market allows for the growth of new jobs for women. I want to remind, to remind you that in a recent meeting organized by the Bank of Italy, the General Director Saccomanni sustained that the gap between the Italian female employment rate and the target fixed by the Lisbon Treaty means for Italy a loss of, in GDP of seven points. Another aspect we must to focus, it's the enhancement of women's human potential. Uh, the way toward enhance, enhancing women's work and overcoming the gender stereotype is to promote actions to change the management culture, also through specific training and consulting. It is, in this sense, it's appropriate to plan initiatives to raise awareness 
of the importance of the contributions of women at all levels of business and promote female empowerment. It would be useful to award businesses that have ex experiences in quality in human resource management from a gender perspective, just as the cooperative organization can do. This involves measuring the improvements achieved through periodic audits. In this sense, Liga Coop, another Italian organization um, whose I represent, carried out a specific project whose main goals were developing in the cooperatives the awareness of cost and benefit of equal opportunity policies, providing tools for an improved quality in the organizational processes from a gender point of view, considering equal opportunities a widespread way to look at the organization, valuing and monitoring several steps of, for improvement. The most uh, important results of the project have been how the organizational system was involved in agreeing on the goals, top to bottom, through training programs and focus group. The company data was read from a gender point of view. The critical point of, or, of or, organization from a gender point of view were focused on. Some proposals for improvement are included in a plan for the equal opportunities approved by the company management body, management body and a specific period has been set for its implementation. Also, the third Italian cooperative organization, AGCI, that this year set up its women committee, promoted the project about the development of female man management and all the tools to facilitate the work-life balance, also bringing together the, be the best practices carried out by the associated cooperatives. Other important tools for the adoption of equal opportunity policies are codes of conduct. In Italy, the Charter for Equal Opportunity and Equality in the Workplace has been promoted and is supported, among others, by the Ministry of Labour and Social Policy. This charter was signed by the Italian Cooperative Organization and many associated cooperatives. Moreover, in the same way, Italian Cooperative Organization um, have planned or are introducing minimum quotas for the general representative bodies. They also approved gu guidelines requiring a minimum percentage, percentage of female presence in the board of cooperative, in line with the, the law passed last year in Italy to introduce quotas for women in the board of listed and public company. Now I'll give the floor uh, to Max. Thank you, Dora. I'm going to give a quick overview of some of the things that are going on in the UK and then talk a bit more about some of the things the cooperative group are doing, just to give you a context, and then I'm going to hand back to Dora. Now, I think we're running slightly short on time, so some of the things, fortunately now, our board directors have talked about, so I shall skip over them slightly, uh, slightly more. It's all right. Works well for this one. Okay, so we have a long history of women at the heart of the movement. The Women's Guild was founded in 1883 and 1892 in Scotland. And there was, you know, that was a really, really amazing start. When you look back at the history and the heritage, that was an amazing thing. And the, the Women's Guild have really pushed gender equality. But where are we now? We're certainly not at gender parity. And it's a really inconsistent story across cooperatives. I think we heard in the debate, in the panel debate, about some of those inconsistencies. And it is complex. It's not surprising to you all, not all co-ops are the same. 
lots of the different structures seem to uh, favour women more or support women more. And the research that Co ops UK did and some of the research that has gone on in the past does show that things like worker cooperatives and some of the housing co cooperatives have a much more positive female participation. We've also talked about mid counties. There's also Lincolnshire and Channel Islands, and I apologise to the Channel Islands people because I didn't realise that, um, who are actually have this gender parity on their boards, or even more, as we can see from these stats. So there isn't a consistent story even in the consumer cooperative movement. We haven't got you know one size fits all or a, a kind of you know a line that we can all take. I think perhaps the one thing we can take in the consumer movement at the moment is there is a, a, an underrepresentation of senior women, and that seems to go from what I've seen across most of the consumer cooperatives. Adding to the complexity is all the things that go on outside of the cooperative movement. So some of the positives, the Davis report, it was great to have that report out there. It was great to have that debate. It felt like it was starting to change. Even the debates have started to change. The economic climate, we've heard today that women have fared worse in the economic climate, certainly in the UK. You know, more women are struggling. The new changes in education, something that's very close to my heart and the other part of what I do. Some of the new changes in curriculum, um, the early thinking is it's actually going to take women back. Some of the systems of modular systems and support and less having an exam at the end helps young women and help them succeed in education. And it feels like we might be taking a step backwards in that direction. The fact the EU ruling came out as it did, you know, it would have been great to have a very clear place to work towards. And then women in the cabinet, we're not moving forward, we are moving backwards. And so some of these things, it feels like, you know, we're making incremental steps, but we're not always getting to the place we want to be. So the cooperative group, we're a large, large consumer cooperative, 76% women, and I'm sure someone will notice my slight miscalculation of five women on board, which makes 25%, um, sorry. Then, you know, that is a movement forward. Actually, our 25% is really positive. And, um, you know, I think it was Susan at the back that said we shouldn't forget the journey we've been on. We shouldn't forget the positive things. And I think that's really key for me because if we are constantly focusing, and there are, are a lot of negatives, but we need to focus on the movement forward. Certainly, uh, women in managers for us, um, the further you go up, so 17% of our executive are female. So some of the things we're doing, okay, how do we carry on moving forward? The Membership Diversity Working Group has been in existence since 2001, and it has moved things forward, and I can see some of the people around the, the room that are from that group, and it has moved forward. I think the, the issue for those members is it's been too slow. There's also now a Board Diversity Strategy Group, which has an overview of both the HR and the membership side. And one of the things that the HR side doing, is doing is a strong network supporting women managers, which has just started and having a really positive reception. One of the things I'd just like to say before we move on to some of the other things that we're going to talk about today is one of the really key steps the diversity, um, Board Diversity Strategy Group has pushed for is a diversity policy. Now, I know we're talking about gender, so we are, I will focus on the gender targets. But for us, it was very key that the board had a policy which set out its vision for both gender equality and diversity in general. It's really important to have leaders. It's really important to have that culture that says, this is what we want to do. Its aim is to make sure that our composition is reflective of the diverse communities we serve. And that's really important to us, because when we particularly talk about the wider diversity issues, we're not looking for one of everyone. We're looking for us to reflect the communities we serve. We serve very different communities with very different groups, and that's one of the things we're very passionate about. So the targets are for gender, BAME, carers, disability, and I don't know why um, that's slight error, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender um, is the other group we're looking at for set targets. So the targets for gender, and it was really interesting actually because it was listening to Agnes about the, the point about should it be females or should it just be equal representatives. And I think we possibly need to have that conversation with the Board Diversity Strategy Group of whether they want to change that language to reflect the, some of the debate that's gone on today. But 
We want to have 33% of females on our boards by 2016. Now we've staggered it, and this is because we believe in setting really realistic targets. We know where we're starting from. We know we're in a democratic structure, so we need to build from our area committee upwards. But we do want it to be ambitious, so each of the boards is comprised of a minimum of 40% by 2018. And then just so we're making sure we're keeping this going, the, all the other boards where we have perhaps less diverse uh, makeup, we want them to have 30% by 2020. The other thing that you've heard a lot about today and Alison set out was the Women's Challenge. And it's something the cooperative group is really proud to be part of and really proud to be um, supporting. And some of the things I've talked about, so making our elected structure representative, that's our board diversity policy. Getting more senior women into management, that's our Aspire network. And take rediscovering our heritage and taking a lead. And it's the one thing, actually, I think the women within the cooperative movement do very, very powerfully. And it's actually something that our women need to share outside of the movement and get more women involved. I see the women around that are passionate about climate change, that are passionate about democracy and politics. And for me, this is really an outward-looking one. We need to take it outside and encourage more women to get involved. I'm going to hand over to Dora, who's going to talk a bit about what next for Europe. Only a few, mo few moments. Um, I think that the, wor the work-life balance uh, and the promotion of women uh, to top management roles uh, and to management bodies of enterprises uh, are an important area of joint work uh, within uh, the European cooperative system. According to the specific cooperative mission uh, at enhancing all the human capital, I also believe that we all agree that increasing and enhancing female employment strengthens the competitiveness of enterprises. We know many European countries, especially Northern European, as our colleague showed before about the Norwegian experience, uh, that are more advanced on, uh, on these issues. Uh, we, starting from the European conference organized, organized in Rome in uh, 2010, in collaboration with, with the Cooperatives Europe and with the contribution of six European cooperative organizations, particularly France, Germany, Poland, Spain, Sweden, United Kingdom, United Kingdom we would like to identify an opportunity to work together more closely with the European colleagues on the issue of the female employment in cooperatives. We can use the occasion um, of uh, today's forum to begin a joint project uh, forecasting periodic appointments, appointments to compare the different best practices and to draw up proposal for the national governments, also in terms of laws, um, for, example, for example, quota laws, and, and for the European Commission. Uh, for us, it's time to build a European network of women cooperators, and we, we hope that this project uh, uh, will be a reality in, in the future. Thank you.